Okay, I need to preface something before I go any further. Um, if you're looking at my face, uh, I did not eat a chocolate chip muffin this morning. That is not chocolate on my upper lip. It's worse, I nicked myself this morning. How long have I been shaving my face for? Well, yesterday was my first day. No, I'm joking. <laughs> All right. Uh, in May of 2021, the Davies car family made close to $800,000 off of the sale of their original YouTube video. You heard that right. We live in a world today in which you can literally sell a viral video. Like what was in a previous generation, your best bet was on America's Funniest Home Videos. Now you're making yourself a few hundred grand off of these videos. Uh, you might be wondering, why am I talking about a viral YouTube video beyond it being a, a little bit of a cultural moment that now we're selling these things? Well, for starters, I bet you know this family. Uh, anybody show of hands know who the Davies Carr family? Okay, I bet you, you know them. We have the video so you can see who they are. <laughs> Charlie. Charlie bit me. There we go. Look at that. that and who remembers that coming out? 2007, huge viral moment, uh, close to 900 million YouTube views. So what happened was these parents, they filmed their children doing something cute, and they took their 15 minutes of fame and extended it really far just to see how far they could take it. And more than a decade later, they're here selling that video for $800,000. Being viral pays. The moral of what I want to teach about today is that if we want to be people who are wealthy, we must first have children and then record them all the time. <laughs> that is what I want to talk about this morning. You know, we've actually already begun doing this with Andy. We got a little baby GoPro, so, you know, we see everything. A, a few bonus tips if you, you know, put them in, like, precarious, like, funny situations, right? Like, we get the bowl of spaghetti out and then leave the room and let them mash it and then come back. That's a surefire way. If you have a couple kids, then that's, like multiplication, you know, there's uh, play against each other. Uh, I tease, all joking aside, the natural human response for us when we have a moment of, uh, uh, of being seen or being noticed, maybe we, we have a bit of a viral moment, is to continue that momentum, right? To see how far that momentum can take us. Today's story is the complete opposite. In fact, today's teaching is actually a lesson in how not to go viral. Uh, here's where we are in the story. Jesus has just gone and fed, uh, fed the 5,000 men, which we know is likely more like 15 to 20,000 people. Not only did they witness his teaching, he's, he's a massive crowd, but they've literally partaken in a miracle. Yeah. Right? So 15 to 20,000 people. I imagine that there were publishers, you know, waiting to sign Jesus on his first book deal. The disciples are starting to plan out, like, what city are we going to go to next? You know what I mean? we got to get this ball rolling. Jesus just might be the new lead rabbi at the mega synagogue in Jerusalem. Like, we don't know. Sky's the limit with this Jesus fellow. And yet, in a few short verses, what we're going to read today, we see that this crowd will go from 20,000 to 12. In fact, what we're going to be talking about next week is uh, the account in which the people leave Jesus because of his difficult teaching. So it's with that context in mind that we're going to look at today's passage. Let, let's give a little bit more of that context. So like what we just said, Jesus has performed the miracle uh, of the loaves, 10,000 plus people are fed. And we read in verse 15 that the people are acknowledging that there's something special about Jesus. They, they say that he must be the prophet. And this is an allusion to the time of Moses in which, in which uh, Moses prophesies. He says that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And then this is God talking. He says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. You will tell him everything I command him. So here's the leading assumption. Jesus is starting to look like this prophet. He's starting to look like the one we want to see. What's kind of funny is that in the Gospels, when you hear somebody referring to Jesus as a prophet, it usually means that they actually don't have a full understanding of who Jesus is, their understanding is a little bit dim. And we see just a verse later how dim their view is. It says in verse 15, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew to a mountain by himself. So here's the logic. Moses was a prophet, 
who freed the people from their Egyptian slavery, which must mean that if this is the greater prophet, then surely he's going to come and free us from our Roman occupation. This is the guy we're looking for. And they actually didn't care about what Jesus thought about it. D.A. Carson notes this. He says, if he, he being Jesus, was unwilling to assume the prerogatives and responsibilities of such leadership, they were more than willing to force the issue by fomenting a rebellion, crowning him king, and daring the authorities to respond, thus forcing to assume the mantle they had in mind for him. So Jesus is on the run. He, he, he makes an escape, and we have a mob on a mission. They witness Jesus, and they want to make him king. Like, talk about a good moment. One afternoon with the guy, and they want to crown him as their king. But what we see here is actually very telling because Jesus is going to tell us two things. He's going to tell us, first of all, who he isn't, and then we're going to learn who he actually is. So let's start off with who he isn't, starting in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? So they catch up to him, and they call him Rabbi, which is kind of ironic because they're calling him teacher, which is what Rabbi means, and yet they're going to disagree with everything his teachings say in just a moment. And this is the moment where Jesus could have redeemed himself. This is where he could have taken it to the next level, right? They could have been like, we didn't see you coming. And Jesus would have been like, well, yeah, I walked here. And they'd be like, oh, we were walking along the same trails. We didn't see you. Oh, sorry, I walked on water here, right? Like Jesus could have had that moment, double miracle time, right? Like he could have just, you know, blown up in this moment. And yet he does the opposite. He exposes them and their motives. Verse 26 says, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Very truly is Jesus' way of saying, listen up, this is important. And what he means here when he's saying you ate the loaves and had your fill is he's not saying you've come back to me because you had a really nice sandwich yesterday and you want another. He's saying something actually much deeper. He's saying you came to me because I gave you what you wanted in a moment. You were filled up. You actually received a material need. And not only did you receive a material need, but you saw what I could do for you. That there's potential in a guy like me to help you get to where you want to go. See, they wanted to be near Jesus, not because they saw him for who he was, but because they saw him as an addition to what they were already doing. Now, as we read scripture, we must remember that scripture is simultaneously reading us. That as we're reading it, the words act as a mirror that point back to us. And while we weren't in that crowd, I believe that the exact same heart of the people in that crowd is very much alive and true in myself and in us. The question that Jesus is asking here is, what do you want from me? Or maybe a, a, a bit deeper than that is what on earth do you want most? What is the thing that you want most? And when I say that, I don't mean like what is it that's on your vision board or like what are your goals? I mean what are the things that you pine after, that you think about, that you, you love more than anything else? A few ways to think about this is imagine yourself. You're on a walk. You don't have much on your mind. You're just having a nice afternoon stroll. What's the thing that comes to your mind when you've got nothing else to think about? Or maybe, what is the thing that if you lost it, it would destroy you? Or if you gained it, it would make you? What are those things? These are often known as idols or attachments. They are disordered loves, which means that often they're actually not bad things. They're good things in the wrong order that have taken a disproportionate place in the position of our hearts. That what we do is we take the space that was made for the creator and we fill it with the things of creation. Yeah. They, they're the things that we believe that we actually need in order to find fulfillment, happiness, security, and joy. And we all live with idols, and, and hint, yours probably isn't God. And these idols will eventually become the lens through which we see all of life. We see this taking place in this story. The story of the Israelites up to this point is now, at this point, hundreds of years they have been under some form of occupation whether it be Egyptians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, Romans. And the belief was that one day a kind of messianic king would come, a ruler, warrior, leader would come along and free them from their bondage and slavery, taking them out in order that they could be an independent and free people. And this was the story by which these people lived by. This was the hope. 
that one day, they longed after it, they could be a free people. And because they lived with this story, they saw Jesus through that lens. They saw him as someone who could help them on that journey. And like I said, scripture reads us, we do the same as well. Think about it through a few examples. Let's say you long for relationship in your life, whether it be friendship or something a little bit more. And because you have that relational hole in your heart, that, re- that, that desire to have people around you, you encounter Jesus, and Jesus actually fills that space in your life. You find that Jesus is good. You begin to say things like, God, you were good to me when nobody else was. God, you are the only one I can rely on. God, you are my husband when I need you. And then we find a husband or we find a friend. And the God who took up center stage ends up on the fringes because we found what we were actually looking for apart from Jesus. Imagine for a moment you find yourself looking, uh, your life is out of control. Things are, are not going your way. And you find yourself longing for control in your life, longing for order. And Jesus comes along in your life and you encounter somebody who provides order. He provides wisdom. He has some of, if, he has the best teachings of all time on what it looks like to be truly human. And you find yourself relying on him. He is a good teacher, at least until his teachings counter what you actually want most. And then the teacher becomes somebody who you no longer want to follow. Or imagine for a moment you find yourself looking out into the world and hoping that things would be better, hoping for change. And because of that, you find, in Jesus, you find teachings that that correspond with what you want to see, and because of that, he ends up becoming somebody that champions what you believe, at least until his teachings counter what you want to believe. And the subtle twist in all of these examples is that they are at least in part true. Jesus wants to be a primary relationship in your life. Jesus wants you to be a whole and healthy person, and Jesus wants the world to be a good place. He wants the world to be a just place. The problem with idols is that they twist our hearts and our motives in order that we take a part of Jesus and sacrifice him, or sorry, we take uh, who Jesus is and sacrifice him on the altar of who we want him to be. Our idols demand this of us. Is Jesus able to perform great miracles? Yes. Is Jesus king? Yes, but when we focus on that because we love the means more than the actual person, then we twist who he really is. In essence, we make Jesus in our image as opposed to conforming to his. That is the message of what we see here. Make no mistakes. When Jesus enters a person's life, he is coming for the very center. If there's one thing that Jesus will not settle for, it's second. And it's not because Jesus is arrogant or insecure. It's not because he needs your praise in order to fill up his self-esteem. No, it's because we as human beings were created for God to be at the center. So for us to put anything else at the center is to our own detriment. That is the truth of what we see here. And yes, Jesus is patient because this isn't true of us yet. We all have idols. There are all places in which Jesus hasn't taken center stage. And yes, we have the spirit who helps us. The spirit makes God's love real to us. And we're journeying that way. But we have to know that if Jesus is real in our life, then he is going to confront the things that we hold on to dearly. Not because he's punishing us, but because he loves us. And if he doesn't, we will fall because everything else will fail. Verse 28 continues, and it says, Then they asked him, What must we do to do the work God requires? So Jesus says, uh, he, he, he uses the word work here, and they latch on to that word. And Jesus answered, The work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. So they hear work and they latch onto it. See, if we can't make Jesus an addition to our life, then we will surely make him a commodity, something that we can earn. We live in a time and a culture in which being driven is a key attribute. Um, They did a study of those in Gen Z, the emerging generation, and they found that 44% of them would say that personal and professional achievement is very important to their sense of self. To put into perspective, that's greater than family, Friends, hobbies, and God. We live in a driven society. But here's the secret about being driven and achievement is that most of the time it's actually a cover for our control freak, our sense and our need to control. See, because to work for something means that I've earned it. And if I earn something, that means that the ball is in my court. That means I have control. I am in control of my own destiny. This is the posture of the people. Just tell me what to do and I can do it. And most of us, if we're being honest, we actually live like this. We don't notice it. Uh, in particular, we don't notice it when things are going well. But we find that when things are going wrong, we, we, we think or we say things like this. 
I didn't deserve this. Or I'm a good person. Or I did this, so why is my output like this? My input should result in a certain output. And in saying or thinking those things, the implicit message here is if I do good things, I can merit favor with God. I can earn the approval of God. And the honest truth is that sometimes I think we don't always like the fact that grace is a gift from God because it means that we aren't the ones in control of our relationship. We don't like it because we aren't the ones. See, a relationship with God is not something you primarily do. It's something primarily done to you. See, we respond to Jesus' call, yes, but it's God who's been doing the knocking. And then Jesus continues, and he says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. When we hear believe, we tend to think of it from like the perspective of proving something is true. So we think to believe in the work of, uh, the work is to believe as in like to believe that we exist in the Milky Way or something like that, like to observe the facts and then come to a conclusion. But here in this context, belief looks way more like having a conversation with a friend and that friend saying to you, do you believe what I'm saying is true? It's relational truth. Synonyms for this kind of belief would be faith or trust. And you know what's interesting about the exemplars of faith and trust and belief in the New Testament? Do you know who they are? It's children, women, and those on the fringes of society. In that time and day, it's the people who did not have a voice, who Jesus says, these are the people who trust. Think about Mary pouring the oil on Jesus, or or Jesus saying, you must have faith like a child. And this makes sense. If we look at a child, for example, children are wide-eyed, they're not bitter, they can look and believe in something, but also children recognize their dependence. They do not try to do it themselves because they know they will fail if they do it themselves. And isn't that so different than what we see in this kind of driven narrative? That to be driven or to be successful is to do it yourself, to accomplish it. Whereas the gospel in Jesus comes along and says, don't look at what you can do, but look at what I have done for you. This is what Jesus says. The passage continues, starting in verse 30. It says, so they asked him, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, again, listen up, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives light to the world. To paraphrase what they're saying here is essentially prove it, like show us what you got. Um, The thought here is that they're saying to Jesus essentially, if you are presenting yourself as like a better Moses, Moses gave us manna in the wilderness, so ought you not to give us something even better than that. If you know the story of of the Exodus, we find that God provided for the people in the wilderness and that he gave them this this bread-like substance called manna in which uh, every day, as they would wake up, it would appear before them. But it was a sign of God's providence and yet the food would spoil if, if held onto. So it was also a reminder of God's continuous provision. So what's hilarious if you read it in context is to think about it that just yesterday they were given bread from heaven and now they're saying, not good enough. Isn't that funny how our human heart works? That was a gift yesterday is now a given. That we expect what was once amazing to us from God, that the human heart has the ability to circle around things or or to work its way around it in order that we actually won't see what we don't want to see. Jeremiah 17 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. They take what was a gift and turn it into an expectation. And the hidden question here is this. Do these people actually want Jesus to be Jesus? Or maybe more poignantly for us is do we actually want Jesus to be Jesus? See, oftentimes we love him as a friend and as a guide, but do we want him to be the one thing, the Lord of our lives? Yes, when we encounter Jesus, he meets us with unimaginable grace and love, and it's the most amazing thing. And yet, like what we just talked about, when we encounter Jesus, we will inevitably be confronted with those things that sometimes are easier to be hidden in the dark, right? John begins his gospel by saying, the light has overcome the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. That if Jesus is real, we are hit with a healthy dose of reality. There are major implications to his truth being true. Diedrich Bonhoeffer said it like this. 
By sheer grace, God will not permit us to live even for a brief period of time in a dream world. Jesus says, again, he says, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. A couple quick insights here. Jesus is saying your sights are off. You keep pointing back to Moses, and yet don't you recognize that it wasn't Moses who made bread appear. It was, it was the Father, right? And this isn't downplaying Moses as much as it is right-sizing God. Moses would be the first one to tell you, hey, it wasn't me. It was God. Also, notice the little subtle shift where Jesus is kind of putting himself in the camp of the Father as in, as in the camp of a human, as well as there's a shift in tenses. It says that it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives in the present the true bread from heaven. So they say, sir, always give us this bread. In their mind, they're thinking this is literal bread. Like this is way better than any of our COVID sourdough loaves. This is like the <laughs> ultimate loaf of bread. That's what they are envisioning. And Jesus says this. This is where we shift to Jesus telling us who he actually is. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the first of what are known as the I am statements of Jesus. Um, they're, they're pretty special. They're actually unique to the Gospel of John. And what they do is they do a couple things. First of all, they point to the divinity of Jesus. Um, I am goes back again to the time of Moses. You'll find a lot of connections to Moses, in which Moses is having an interaction with God, and he's saying, what will I tell the people your name is? And we read in Exodus 3, this is God's response. I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So Jesus pairs that with a picture that explains his character or his purpose or his mission. And here we see that Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Bread being like the staple dish of a diet. It was, it was kind of the foundational piece. I mean, even today, even though, again, we live in like a gluten-free world, bread is still a very important dish or a very important staple in our diet. It would be like saying to somebody, I want you to learn how to cook breakfast, and I want you to be the best breakfast chef of all time, but you can't ever use eggs, right? Like eggs are synonymous with breakfast as bread was to the diet. It was the foundational piece. But he also says this in dialogue with the thoughts around manna, right? They were just talking about how, how uh, God gave Moses manna. And what Jesus is saying here is that you will never go hungry because I have the manna that won't fail. The bread you want, the bread you're looking for, I am actually it. I am the thing to which everything else is pointed to, right? The manna, let's look at that, which was a gift from God. It was sustenance for the people, and yet the manna eventually spoils. It was a pointer to the real thing. Yeah. Or let's look at Moses. Moses, a gift from God, a, a prophet, a, a vessel that God used, and yet Moses as well faded. Moses died. He was a pointer to the one who would come. Let's go even bigger than that. The law of Moses, the thing that God gave Moses as a gift to the people, it was kind of the, um, the rules of engagement for their relationship with him. And yet it was also, from the very beginning, a signpost that the people needed a savior. It was the thing that they could point to to say, I am not able to do it. I need someone bigger than me. All of scripture is pointing to Jesus. We can look at it like this. The Bible is a unified story that leads us to Jesus, that every single through line connects us and everything else is a sign. Um, my, my wife and I, we love to go to, to movies or to watch movies. Any other big movie fans in the house? Yeah, that means movies. Who doesn't? Um, you know, and one of the best parts about going to the movies is watching trailers, right? Like, it's exciting when you see a movie you're looking forward to and the trailer's playing. Like, Aaliyah's weird. Aaliyah will make sure. She does not want to go see the movie if we're late. She needs to be there so we can watch all the trailers. I will send her in while I go get the popcorn so that she can watch the trailers. But wouldn't it be weird if we went and we bought movie tickets, and then we went and got the popcorn, and we grabbed a seat, and we watched the trailers, and then after the trailers, we got up and left? Or wouldn't it be even stranger if we watched a movie and we were telling our friend how much we love this movie, it was so good, and then they said, oh, I want to watch it too. And I, and I sat them down, and I went to YouTube, and I put on the trailer, and I said, well, if you watch this, you'll get the gist. You don't really need to watch the real thing. That would be silly, because trailers are made for movies. Movies are not made for trailers. A trailer is a sign to the bigger picture, as in, as in these were signs to the reality of who Jesus was. 
If this talk about the Bible and Jesus being uh, the fulfillment feels too abstract for you, let me say it like this. Every good thing you experience is a shadow of the fullness that we find in God. Every good thing we find in this world is a shadow. We talked about just earlier, rest, right? We long for a good sleep. If you ever have a good sleep and you wake up refreshed, that's amazing, but it is nothing compared to the rest that we find in relationship with God. Or you find yourself in conversation with a friend or a family member, and you know when you're having a good conversation and it like warms up the heart and you feel a joy creeping in? That's a fraction of the joy that we get to experience for eternity when we have the ultimate relationship with God. Or have you ever done something where you feel really proud of yourself and and there's people that you look up to and they, they come to you and they tell you that you did a good job. And again, that affirmation, it feels good. That is nothing compared to the one pair of eyes that actually matter in the world that look at you and say, you are my child. You have an identity that cannot be broken. That is confidence. Everything else will fade, but Jesus is our confidence. He is the thing that we look to. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, it means this. All of your longings, all of your hopes, all of your desires, all of your needs, they find their end in me. I am the one thing in this life that will actually and ultimately satisfy. Everything else is a counterfeit. Everything else is only partly true, a cheap imitation of what I have to offer. That is the good news of this story. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he is our hope and our security. I'm going to close here. We're going to hop a few verses because that was a lot of scripture today. Uh, We're going to go to verse 51. And Jesus says this, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the world. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is a real drink. I told the worship team that when I start talking about blood and flesh, it's your time. (laughs) Uh, there's one important detail I forgot to mention in all this, that we actually have a glimpse in, into when this is all taking place. Back in John 6, verse 4, it says this. The Jewish Passover festival was near. We know that this takes place during the, the, during, during the Passover. And the Passover was the kind of central Jewish celebration. Again, back to Moses. It points back to the time in which God instructed his people to sacrifice a lamb, Uh, brushed the blood over the doorpost, the angel of death would pass by, and then they partook in the meal, they partook in the the sacrifice animal. And we see that the connections here are actually endless. D.A. Carson notes a few. The sacrifice lamb points to Jesus' death. The manna points to the life-sustaining bread. The Exodus freedom narrative points to our ultimate freedom from sin. And the Passover meal points to the sacrament of communion. See, Jesus being Jesus, he tends to make them these things about himself. He takes what is a holiday and he says, this is actually about me. He is the ultimate meal. He is the actual thing that leads to life. And we as followers of Jesus, we're following along with the story and we have the advantage of knowing where this goes. We know that there will come a point in which what Jesus is saying here will be grounded in reality. That Jesus will make this real, that he will become the source of our life in order, it be, in doing so, he will lose his. For Jesus, life always comes through death. His body broke in order that we had bread to eat. His blood was spilled in order that our cups might be filled. His life was taken from him in order that we might have eternal life. Now, even with with all this context, I think we can all say this is a bit of a strange passage, right? The people people are aware of this. In fact, when they heard what was going on, when they heard these words of Jesus, they began to kind of mentally pack their bags, right? They were able to label Jesus as maybe delusional, a bit off, heretical, maybe even dangerous. Paul points to the, the uniqueness of this story when he says this in 1 Corinthians. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. The truth is, I wouldn't write a story like this if I was writing one. And you probably wouldn't either. If you were writing a messianic story, you probably wouldn't write the story of your your central figure, your hero, dying a humiliating death. 
or sharing a story that, that, went, that made him go from 20,000 to 12, or him telling his followers that they must drink his blood and eat his flesh. And because this is strange, I want to say this, that actually isn't, that's a feature, that's not a bug. See, because when I read a passage that feels a little bit strange to me, I'm reminded that this is not my story, this is God's story. This isn't a story I would write because it's a story God has written. Because when it seems strange and uncomfortable, I'm reminded of it. This is the invitation of communion a rhythmic reminder that has been around for 2,000 years in which we look at what Jesus has done for us and we partake in it. To reflect and receive the love of God who is not made in my image, but a God who's forming me in his. A God who doesn't just say, I love you, but a God who physically showed us he loved us. A God who really was and is a God who is alive. This is not my story because this is God's story and he is inviting you to be a part of it. And that's what we get to do together. I'm going to invite us all to stand right now, if you're able. And in a moment, we're going to worship together, but we also have communion this morning, which is such a beautiful thing, isn't it? We're reading a 2,000-year-old story, and yet we're partaking in it right now. And as we take the bread and the cup, which signify Jesus' life poured out for us, this is for those who, who come under the authority of Jesus as their Lord. It's a, a, a kind of thanksgiving meal for what Jesus has done. And in a moment, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to invite you to partake in communion. But before you do, I actually want you to take some time to reflect as we worship, and reflect on the places and spaces in which you have formed Jesus in your own image, in, in the ways in which you haven't trusted Jesus with the, in a specific area, you haven't trusted that he's actually as good as he says he is. And when you're ready, I'll invite you uh, to partake communion as, as an act of recommitting our life, of, of looking to Jesus. But before we do, we repent. To repent simply means to turn. We acknowledge where we've missed the mark and we turn back to Jesus. And I believe that as we do this, the real Jesus will encounter us. So let me pray, and then take time to reflect and we'll worship. Father, we thank you. We thank you that your story is good. You are the one true story, the story that actually fulfills what it sets up to do. Jesus, we acknowledge and we look at you as the bread of life. You are the only thing that we can actually find hope, security, and sustenance in. And we acknowledge that that would not be the case if it wasn't for your sacrifice. We thank you that you, your body broke for us, that your blood was shed for us, and because of that, we celebrate. Because of that, we partake in the life that is eternal. We pray this in Jesus' name.